Church of Ender. We have already noted that the fallen angels at the time of the deluge were barred from further materialization. Since then, they have sought other ways to influence humanity. Few would communicate with them if they knew their real character. Hence, they represent themselves as being our dead friends and relatives. As such, they attempt to communicate with the living through mediums who are deceived, else they would not serve as mediums for demons. In olden times, these mediums were called witches, wizards, necromancers. They had familiar spirits, or were familiar with the spirits who were disobedient in the days of Noah. God had forewarned Israel against these evil spirits and their mediums. He said that no such medium should be permitted to live in the land of Israel. They might operate amongst nations not under divine care, but God's representative Saul was commanded to put to death all such. When King Saul got out of fellowship with God, who refused further communication, he turned for advice to a witch at Ender and asked her to awaken Samuel the prophet, who meantime had died. The evil spirit impersonated Samuel easily enough, and the witch gave the king messages in his name, whereas Samuel was dead and could not give or receive messages. King Saul saw nothing. He merely received an answer from the witch, who said she saw and heard Samuel. The evil spirits have some way of knowing much respecting the future, but anybody under the circumstances might have known the fate to expect for Saul and his army. The king himself knew what to expect. It was this that troubled him and led him to seek the witch, contrary to the divine command. It is not for a moment supposable that God and Samuel, having refused to communicate with the king, would change and permit a witch condemned by the divine law to overrule the matter. Prophet reproof. There is one thing about the Bible distinctly different from every other book. It's honesty. Although David was king and his own family succeeded him for generations, nothing prevented the full details of his misdeeds in respect to Uriah and his wife. The wrong is as fully exposed as though the king had been a menial of the lowest class. The prophet of the Lord was sent directly to the king by divine command. He made a parable showing the injustice and asked what would be the just decision. King David was angry and asked the name of the unjust man that he might be punished. God's prophet fearlessly declared, Thou art the man. Humbly, the king confessed his sin to the Lord. He had already seen his horrible mistake, but his portrayal intensified the wrong. He wept and prayed before the Lord in sackcloth and ashes for forgiveness. In this respect, David was a man after God's own heart. Every time he was overtaken in a fault and snared by his own weakness, he confessed, reformed, and sought forgiveness. God accepted King David's penitence and restored him to his favor, but this did not prevent his suffering punishment for his wrong cause. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. The honesty of the Bible is exemplified in both the Old Testament and the New. We are told of Abraham's mistake, the friend of God. We are also told the faults of the apostles. The noble Saint Peter was so overcome with fear and he denied his master three times with oath. We are told of St. Peter's dissembling before Jews and Gentiles. We are told that St. Paul, the apostle that took the place of Judas, was once the cruel Saul of Tarsus, who authorized the stoning of St. Stephen and was very injurious to the early church. Of St. Peter and St. John we read, they were ignorant and unlearned men. No other book in the world manifest so great honesty or deserves the same confidence as the Bible. Solomon in all his glory, as King David, who was after God's own heart, loyal to him, represented the Christ in earthly trials, 
afflictions and victories, so King Solomon typified the church glorified. Whereas King David's reign was full of wars, King Solomon's had none. He was not only a prince of peace, but was a wise, rich king who builded the temple of Jehovah. King Solomon's fame spread abroad through the then civilized earth. The queen of Sheba, who came to see for herself, declared that the half had never been told. Jesus referred to this visit of the queen of Sheba, saying that she came from a great distance to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Thus she put to shame the people of Palestine, who disregarded the great teacher of superior wisdom, a greater than Solomon. Evidently our appreciation of values depends much upon the eye. So the eyes of our understanding must be opened before we can truly appreciate spiritual things. Thus Jesus said to his followers, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Already we see many of the inconsistencies of the past. No longer would a Roman Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury condemn to the flames Sir John Oldcastle because of Episcopalian differences. Our eyes, both Catholic and Protestant, have opened and are still opening. What we evidently need is that the eyes of our understanding should be opened widely, that we might see the length and breadth, the height and depth of the love of God. God is pleased to open the eyes of only a small class at the present time, namely, that class which turns from sin and makes a full consecration to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Their eyes shall be opened that they may see the King in his beauty, even by the eye of faith, looking through the telescope of God's word, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, the followers of Jesus are changed into the same image, from glory to glory. The Temple of the Lord. We have already noticed that the tabernacle represented God's temporary residence with the Israelites. Later on, the temple was substituted for the tabernacle. Thus God indicated that he would later abide permanently with his people. King David, as we have seen, represented Christ during this gospel age. He collected the materials for the temple, but was not permitted to build. The lesson is that the divine arrangement complete is not to be established by Christ in the flesh, but by the Christ of glory, represented by Solomon. The temple of Solomon was destroyed in B.C. 606, but later on King Herod who was not a Jew, but a descendant of Esau, favored the Jews by building a great temple, which was in its grandeur in Jesus' day. Those temples were merely typical of the greater temple, which St. Paul and St. Peter declared to be the church. The temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And again, ye are built up a holy temple, a habitation of God through the Spirit. St. Peter declares all of God's faithful saints to be royal priests, living stones in the temple of God, through which eventually all the world shall have access to God. The stones of Solomon's temple were shaped at the quarry before being brought to the temple site. Likewise, its beams were prepared in advance. The workmen put together the temple without sound of hammer. Every piece was so thoroughly fitted that no force was necessary. This typifies the building of the antitypical temple, the preparation of the church in the present life, and their construction by and by as God's spiritual temple by resurrection power. This is the meaning of the trials, chiselings, and polishing which all true Christians must receive. The resurrection change will bring all these living stones together without force or compulsion. Then the glory of the Lord will fill the true temple and the new dispensation will begin. Elijah and the priests of Baal. 
Ahab, king of Israel, misled by his queen Jezebel, perverted the religion in God's typical kingdom. The ordained worship in the temple was neglected and image worship established. The faithful prophet Elijah reproved King Ahab and was compelled by the wicked queen Jezebel to flee into the wilderness, where ravens fed him for three and one half years. Finally, by God's direction, Elijah reappeared and challenged the priests of Baal to a public test as to which God could answer prayer, Jehovah or Baal. Whichever God would accept the offering by fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice should be acknowledged as the true God. The Israelites saw the fairness of the proposition, and Baal's priests could not avoid the issue. Elijah gave them the preference. All day long they agonized, cut themselves with stones, and cried to Baal to accept the offering and vindicate his cause. Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry a little louder. Baal may be sleeping, or perhaps he has gone on a journey. When the evening came, Elijah gave his test. First of all, he had water carried and poured over all the altar and the sacrifice, that there should be no mistake, lest anyone might think of any concealed fire. Then Elijah prayed to God to vindicate his cause. Fire descended from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, licking up even the water in the trench. When the people saw this, they gave a great shout and declared, Jehovah, he is God. Bible students claim that Elijah represented the true church, Queen Jezebel, a false religious system, Ahab, the government of earth. The time of Jezebel's persecution, when Elijah hid in the wilderness and there was no rain for 1260 days, represented 1260 years of spiritual drought. 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D., when the antitypical Jezebel's power to persecute to death ceased. Elisha, Elijah's successor, restored the Shunammite son. King Zedekiah blinded. God promised King David that the Messianic kingdom should come through his line. And for several centuries, no king reigned in Jerusalem except David's posterity. The last was King Zedekiah. Of him, God declared through the prophet, O thou profane and wicked prince, whose time is come that iniquity should have an end. Take off the diadem. Remove the crown. This shall not be the same. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. This was another way of saying that there would be no more kings of David's line until Messiah. This has been fulfilled during the long period of 2,518 years from then until now. All later kings were tributary and none of David's line. When God took his kingdom from Zedekiah, he told him through one of the prophets that he would be carried prisoner by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon, and by another prophet that he would never see Babylon. Both prophecies came true, for Nebuchadnezzar caused his eyes to be put out when a prisoner, and in that condition he went to Babylon. But God promised to David, of the fruit of thy loins shall a king sit upon thy throne forever, was not broken. The message to Zedekiah merely indicates that the throne ceased to be recognized of the Lord and would thus remain until Messiah's kingdom. But the first advent of Jesus did not fulfill this prophecy, for although Jesus is the Messiah, he has not yet entered upon his kingly office. Jesus began his service as a priest. He offered up himself. His offering continues these 1900 years. Since Pentecost, he has been accepting and offering as his members, such as present their bodies living sacrifices. These joint sacrifices are promised as members of the body of Christ, a share in the messianic reign of a thousand years 
for the blessing of Israel and the whole world.